Hello, good to be here. Thank you, people, for having me. Uh, thank you for putting me as the last speaker as well. <laughs> it's a very nice job, especially when you have a couple of graphs that are completely impossible to see in this room. So, uh, so uh, be, be patient. I have uh, 14 slides. Uh, you've got the title right there, Political Parties and Election Fraud. In terms of motivation for this paper, um, there's this distinction between bureaucrats and partisans in terms of uh, electoral administration. So at the micro-local level, i.e. polling stations, there's, there's, uh, there's uh, two different approaches. So you have the Russian case where poll workers are selected by state and local uh, uh, government institutions. In Armenia, uh, you have uh, poll workers that are selected explicitly by political parties. The argument that I'm going to be making on these 14 slides is essentially that for, for a non-democratic ruler in a modernizing state, it, it makes sense to rely on partisan election uh, administrators. And there's an informational story that explains why it makes sense to re rely on partisans. So clearly, relying on partisans to administer, ad administer the election uh, is good for the for the ruler because he knows that they are on his side. They're partisans and they've revealed their partisan preferences. Relying on street level bureaucrats on the other hand clearly uh, could be risky because you never know uh, the political preferences of these street level bureaucrats. So the question really is what is it that partisan poll workers do on election day that benefits the ruling uh, party? So um, in terms of, let's see, okay, the outline slide got lost in translation. Anyway, so there's two, so um, in terms of electoral administration, there's two key characteristics, right? So there's, there's the question about whether or not the electoral commission is formally independent or not. That's not what I'm interested in here. I'm interested in the second question, whether or not the members of the electoral management body on different levels it, uh, are uh, partisans, uh, that is the, 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 the kind of checks and balance model of appointment, or whether or not they're, they're uh, the, the ombudsman model uh, following Wall's uh, terminology. But I'll just say this in terms of the formal independence of electoral commissions. There, there, are, there is evidence that formal independence is, is good for electoral authority. Uh, the question here is, is what are the effects of different appointment systems? So there's the theory of checks and balances, and, and that's something that's uh, 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 kind of coming out of the, the US experience, that if you have partisans administer elections, they are going to be policing each other. And in equilibrium, that's going to produce uh, less fraud, more electoral integrity. And, uh, and there is some evidence that Electoral administration that is partisan, that ha relies on this checks and balance component, that those kind of electoral uh, systems are, are, are more inclusive. So the idea is that all parties get to be part of the administration of the election, and, and therefore uh, the process is more inclusive in terms of number of parties included, et cetera. But as Birch notes in her, her magnificent book, uh, there's really no Cross, convincing cross-national evidence in terms of what system is better in terms of electoral uh, integrity. Again, all of this is based on national level uh, research and I'm going to take this a step further down to their level of uh, presiding officers. So, fraud uh, here focusing on election day fraud. Um, the definition is uh, intentionally altering the results, so that's the definition. We're not looking at the larger category of, of, of manipulation, other things that might be going on during an election. We're looking at intentionally altering the results on election day. So in the literature on fraud and how fraud is organized, there's this idea, uh, both in terms of historical experience, but in the literature, there's this idea that fraud is centralized. So there's, you know, imagine Vladimir Putin sitting in Kreml and he's micromanaging this process. He's, he's telling people what to do and how much to do to give him 
the desired vote that he, he wants. And that might be the case in, 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 in some historical cases like Mexico 88, probably is, you know, it's a case where fraud was centrally managed. Uh, Russia might be a case of that, but I think this larger group of competitive authoritarian cases are cases where it probably is more effective to decentralize uh, fraud because centralizing fraud is risky because you can get caught. Not only can you get ca caught, but you, it's difficult for the ruler to know what are the local constraints on election day. So we already heard uh, that election observers might be randomly assigned in some locations. Well, if that's the case, it's kind of hard for the ruler to know, sitting in Kreml, whether or not the polling station is going to be monitored. So you want to decentralize that decision to the polling station level officials to make whatever decision they need to make to maximize the vote. So the question really is, well, how, 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 can, how can decentralization be done in the most efficient way for the ruler? L let me just say, and I see a, a lot of faces go, oh shit, this guy is talking about enabling fraud. Yes, I'm, 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 I am interested in reducing fraud, so look at my, some of my other work on reducing fraud, but this paper is essentially examining one of the organization kind of the organizational structure for, 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 for enabling fraud and, and examining parties there. So I just <coughs> want to put that out there. But the ruler really faces a, a, a principal agent, got a classical principal agent problem. So do you, you, you want to decentralize fraud, but how can you ensure that poll workers actually do what's in your best interest? So the argument is that parties and poll workers solve this problem for the, for the ruler. Uh, uh, and especially in regimes where there's a strong dominant party, there really is no checks and balance. So the theory about checks and balance might actually not work in some of these countries where, 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 uh, where, where they don't have the same level of robust competitiveness as in, for instance, in the US. The system might not even actually work in the US either, but that's a different, uh, that's a different topic. Anyway, so, so the question really is, what are the effects of ruling party poll workers? So I'm exploiting the fact that in uh, the lovely little country of Armenia in, in uh, South Caucasus, they're randomly assigning the chairman of the polling station. So the first hypothesis is very simple. The ruling party benefits whenever the presiding officer is from their own party. Nothing revolutionary here, but let's just see what the data shows. How are the the, the chairs doing it though? That's the second question. So that's the mechanism. How, how, are they, how do they go about doing that and how can we, how can we find out? So the second hypothesis is, is, is a mechanism hypothesis and it essentially says that the ruling chairs, they're, invalidated, they're invalidating ballots during the count. So they're using their discretion as the chairs of the, of the, the polling station to invalidate ballots in a way that benefits the ruling party. Or the third hypothesis that there's more falsification of uh, the returns during the count. So three straightforward hypotheses, and the case of Armenia, fairly competitive, um, but a dominant party regime. So since 98, one and the same party has been in power. Different presidents, but the party has been in power. So it's a fairly strong um, um, party. Interestingly, the electoral administration is a bit of a hybrid. So it's formally independent, uh, but the appointment system varies depending on the national and local level. So again, a country like Armenia would be, if you look at the, the data that, that Birch has or some of the IDEA data, would be considered a nonpartisan electoral management system. But it turns out that at the local level, they're actually managing the elections by, by partisans. So, there's two elections that I'm going to be looking at. There's the 2012 parliamentary election and the 2013 presidential election. Uh, in the presentation, I'm going to focus on 2013. Uh, this is a presidential regime. The presidential elections are considered to be the high stakes elections, but, but I'm also going to show a slide on the 20, 2012 elections. The 2012 13 elections in February were very interesting. I, I don't expect a lot of you to have followed the, the election. 
but it did get pretty uh, uh, interesting. And for a, for a for a while, there was a, there was a, a hello revolution going on. Uh, that, that's the Armenian word for the for the post electoral protest. But so it was an interesting election in, in, in February 2013. So the design is: there's 41 election districts. There's 2,000 polling stations. Each polling station has six members. So there's a, the local precinct electoral commission in all of these 2,000 polling stations. And the chair and the secretary of each polling commission uh, are randomly assigned prior to the election by the central election uh, commission. Again, the central election commission is nonpartisan. Uh, human rights uh, uh, activists, uh, 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 lawyers, uh, it's a very professional central management body, and they are the ones that are doing this randomization of, of the chairs. In all of these 41 districts, um, the proportion of the shares are determined by the parliamentary strength of the different parties. So again, it's a dominant party regime, so the ruling party gets most of the shares. So it all looks, looks very professional on the surface, but the ruling party gets more shares than any other. Yeah. But anyway, in terms of the experimental design, that essentially leaves me with a, with a block randomized design. The probability of assignment is equal in each of these 41 districts. And to convince you of the, the randomization process, uh, I'm here showing you a graph where we have constructed the... Okay, this is really not... Okay, there it is. The control column here, that's my, that's my control group. That's my control condition. That's the oppositional party, where we don't expect there to be uh, a lot of fraud. That's the, that's the control category. Here we have the treatment column, which is the ruling party, the Republican Party. Here we have the number of chairs. So the oppositional party only gets 110. Chairs, you know, it's a, it's a fairly small oppositional party. Uh, the ruling party gets uh, almost 900. But what we want to look at here is, so we have the two different elections on different rows, and we we'll want to look at some of the historical covariates in terms of polling station level data that would tell us whether or not the randomization was actually uh, producing a balanced, uh, uh, a balanced sample between the control and the treatment group. So as we can see here, focusing on the 2013 row, if we compare the assignment in 2013 with the historical turnout, the turnout in the previous election, we see that they're roughly unbalanced. And as it turns out, in both of these elections, when you compare these two groups, they're really not significantly different in terms of turnout and ruling party vote share, which uh, to me suggests uh, in, in in combination with the randomization protocol, that the randomization was indeed sound. So anyway, so, oh, thank you. There we go. Uh, so these are the results for the first hypothesis. That is the ruling party vote share. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what I want to focus here is in the second, uh, second column. So the second column is the, oh, sorry. Second column is the ruling, the incumbent president vote share. And Again, the control group is the oppositional party, so that's the omitted category. And then we have dummies for each of the parties. So the, the Republican Party, the ruling party, is the first row. And we can see that there's a 2.4% increase in the vote share of the ruling party if they're being assigned a polling station on election day. So 2.4%, and we're interested in the mechanism. So what, are, what is it that they're doing on election day that produces this effect? Well. We could look at the validated ballots, which is the second hypothesis. That's the last column here. So there's a 0.3% um, increase in the number of invalid ballots, which turns out to be a 14% increase uh, uh, when, you, when you consider that the, the, the number of invalidated ballots is pretty low. The third hypothesis, and I'm out of time, I'm just going to uh, put this up there. This is where I apply the last digit test for whether or not the, 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 the result protocols uh, were fabricated or not. So what we would expect there is that in the ruling party category, they're using a lot, of, a lot more zeros as the last digit. 
uh, and that is indeed true, while in all other party chaired polling stations, there's no deviation from that magical 10% line as we would expect in terms of the last digit. So, but what we're really interested in is, in terms of the test statistic, is really the difference between the chi-square, sorry, I'm just gonna show that here. So the chi-square statistic calculates the difference from the expected uh, uniform distribution, which is the green line. The 32 chi-square statistic in, uh, is large and significant at the point zero level. In all other polling stations, it's 16.82. What we're mostly, for most parts, interested in the difference between these two statistics, right? So I could do that by a simulation exercise, and it turns out that indeed the, the difference between the two test statistics that we see suggests that there's a systematic difference between the two groups in terms of the last digit, indicating, again, that the ruling party uh, uh, engaged in this kind of fraud that explains the the ruling party vote share effect. So anyway, interestingly, in 2012, you don't have that effect, indicating that fraud is not used by default, but it's used by whenever uh, needed. So uh, to summarize, uh, hybrid election administration of the type that we see in Armenia really allows for a professional EMB at the central level and partisan micro level uh, administration. And that design itself might be the optimal uh, design for a, for a, for a fraud perpetrating a ruler. Uh, so it's decentralized and interestingly, I just put that out there. Uh, the international observers said that the election where I detected fraud were cleaner in terms of the vote count uh, than the previous election. So, so there's something that the authorities are doing that, that, that produces this effect, but at the same time produces better observer assessments. So this kind of decentralized fraud, I argue, is smart fraud for, for ruling parties. And as, as practitioners, we would need to, to account for that in, in our policy recommendations. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you.